What's it like being an independent contractor? Is it really worth being self-employed? Well, stay tuned because I'm going to answer those questions and more based on my own experience. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Code Porn. You know, I've been an independent contractor now for about three years, and every time I start on with a new team, I'm always asked the same question. What is it like being an independent contractor? Now, I always thought it was kind of a weird question because, what do you mean, what is it like? But I get the impression that they feel that being an independent contractor is like being a prison guard, where I can come and go as I please, while being a full-time employee is like being a prisoner. So I'm going to share with you my experience and give you some insight to what it's like being an independent contractor and being self-employed in the software development field. So why did I want to become an independent contractor? Well, at first I didn't. You know, I've always been concerned with stability. And when it comes to contracts, you don't really have the stability that you do as a full-time employee. Hearing about a three-month contract was pretty scary because, you know, three months, what are you going to do after three months? Three months is barely enough time to get to know somebody. And then what do you do when the three months is up? I really can't afford to be without work while I look for a new contract. I've been a developer since early 2000, right before I graduated high school. And most of that time was spent as a full-time employee with vacation and benefits, a salary. And, you know, I worked at companies that were so safe that I could have stayed there until I retired while doing as little work as possible and getting paid pretty good too. So why would I ever want to leave something like that? Well, what I wanted more than anything was what contracting provided, and that was the ability to work on many different projects and technology stacks and solve a lot of different interesting problems. And that's one of my favorite parts about being an independent contractor. Now, the way that I transitioned into contracting from full-time employment was actually pretty sudden. Just one day on my way to work, I got a call from a recruiter, and she had an eight-week contract for a .NET developer. And it was remote and we could do nights and weekends. And for me, that was awesome. So I said, sure, I'll go ahead and take it because I could use some extra money. A few weeks in, I got an email from somebody who had seen one of my Pluralsight courses, and they wanted to contract me to architect a prototype for a big project that they had. So again, this was a nights and weekends thing, and I took that on. Eventually, I left my full-time job, and I let my network know that I was open to contracts now. And the emails that I got for contracts, instead of deleting them, I would actually respond to them and, you know, look more into them. It's not really exciting, but that is how I made my transition into independent contracting. So let's talk about what it's like to earn a living this way, because there's some really good benefits, but there's also some serious negatives. You know, being out on your own is pretty terrifying, but it can also be really exciting and really rewarding. And there's some really great benefits. So let's go over some of the benefits, or at least what I would consider the benefits of being an independent contractor. The first is short durations. It's inevitable that at some point you're going to have a project or a team or a company that you really just can't stand anymore and you, you just want to make a change. Now for me, I usually get bored about five or six months into a full-time job before I start looking around for other things to entertain me. So contracting was a great way for me to get in and do the interesting work and then get out before I got bored. Having an expectation and an option to be done after a specified time period gives you an out. For me, it's a polite way to say no thank you when I'm offered to come on full time. When a contract ends, it's a way for you to escape without having to go through the ceremony of quitting. But there's a chance that they'll ask you to stay on and if you're interested, by all means, go ahead and convert over to a full-time employee. And that's another great benefit of contracting is you get to see what it's like working in different environments, different companies, and different industries. But I consider myself a code mercenary. I take on your cost for cash, and when the problem is solved, I move on to something else. In my opinion, it's not really a good idea to get attached to a company or a project, and preparing yourself mentally to be done after a specific time period is a great way to prevent that emotional attachment. Now, every contract that I start is another chance to get exposure to something new. Now, I don't mean that I'll go from a .NET contract to a Python contract, although that is possible if you can specialize in both. What I mean, though, is usually development jobs turn into maintenance gigs, where you're working on the same project or the same product 
or in the same technology stack for long periods of time. And this is a trap that can be hard to get out of. Now that's not to say that maintenance gigs are bad, but for somebody with ambition and a desire for growth, it's not really a good spot to be in. Now it's true that every contract that I take on is very similar to the last one. Same kind of work, data in, data out, .NET and JavaScript and so on. But for each contract that I evaluate, I look for interesting projects to work on using interesting or new technologies that I haven't worked with yet, and also industries that I might be interested in learning. For example, earlier this year, I took on a contract that was for a major online e-commerce site. Now the job was nothing more than ASP.NET and SQL Server and some JavaScript, nothing special, but I got to work with and learn Solar as well, and that's what I mean. Now a byproduct of exposure is experience. And experience is one of those things that isn't really understood that well. Now what I mean is, a developer who's been writing code for 10 years doesn't necessarily have 10 years of experience. More often, they have one year of experience just repeated 10 times. And that's a big difference. Now while not impossible, I found it really difficult to gain exposure and true experience while working as a full-time employee. And that's for many different reasons. So contracting is a great way to increase your exposure and actually build true experience if done correctly. Now I'm sure you're wondering about compensation. It's true that contractors are generally paid far better than regular full-time employees. In the Southern California area, for example, I can get paid 50 to 100% more per hour on a six month contract than a regular full-time senior developer. Now generally, the shorter the contract duration, the higher the rate's gonna be. But not all contracts that come up are profitable, so you have to pick and choose carefully. Now when it comes to building your income, I found that contracting is the most efficient way to meet your income goals. Every new contract that comes up is a chance to give yourself a raise. Now try and get a raise every three months from your employer as a full-time employee. Probably not gonna happen. Now, if managed correctly, being an independent contractor could provide a flexible working schedule. Now, this can mean many different things. It can mean custom working hours or days off, telecommuting, or parts of the year where you work and parts when you're on vacation doing whatever you want. Personally, I look for contracts that offer a flexible schedule as far as working hours and also telecommuting. But I've met developers who just like to work half of the year and then spend the rest of the year doing whatever they want. But that's not the norm. It can take a while to get to the point where you can manage a lifestyle like that. And there's a lot of reasons why. So let's jump into what are some of the negatives, or at least what I consider the negative sides of being out there on your own. So unfortunately, contracting is not all fame and fortune. There's things that full-time employees don't have to worry about that independents do. So the first up is instability. Now, just because you sign up for a six month contract doesn't mean that you're gonna have work for six months. It could be just a few weeks into a contract when your client says to you, we don't need you anymore, or they've canceled the project, or whatever the case is. When it comes to the term contract, time frame means little, and is usually never guaranteed. Now, when it comes to firing employees, there's usually some political process that they have to go through in order to make that happen. And I've seen this process save really horrible employees because managers are too lazy to go through the process or companies are too afraid to actually fire somebody for fear of repercussions. But when it comes to contractors, there's no political safety for us. If you mess up, you can get fired on the spot with usually no recourse. Now let's talk about compensation. Now wait a minute, didn't we just talk about compensation as a benefit? Well, the reason why contractors get paid more than W-2 employees is because of the overhead of having a W-2 employee. The contractors are usually on a 1099 or a CDC, which is a corp to corp. Now this means that the contractor is responsible for all of their own expenses, including taxes, medical, and so on. So it's beneficial for companies to hire contractors because even though they're paying a higher rate, it's still cheaper to have them than it is a W-2 employee. So even though you're getting a higher rate, you have additional expenses that W-2 employees don't have. You have to pay for your own taxes, and I mean all of your own taxes, including self-employment tax. You have to pay for your own medical insurance, and that can get pretty expensive. So even though you're getting a higher rate, it's cutting into your potential profits. 
Now, contractors rarely get bonuses or raises. You get paid the rate that you agreed upon in the contract. Now, it's common that you can work more hours and bill for those hours, but overtime is another one of those things contractors don't get. So even though you're working more than your normal 40 hours a week, you're only billing for the same rate. You don't get the overtime rate. Your rate is your rate. So you better be happy with it before you take that contract on. Now contractors have additional responsibilities. And what I really mean is expenses. Now in addition to paying your own taxes, your self-employment tax, your medical insurance and so on, you have other things that you're gonna need such as equipment. When a company hires a full-time employee, Everything they need to do their job is usually provided, so a computer or a laptop, all the software that they need, and so on. But as a contractor, you're probably going to have to provide all that stuff yourself. Now, as a software developer, I need a good laptop, and that costs about $2,000. I also need software and licenses, which again, depending on what I'm doing, could range from $2,000 to $10,000 per year. Now, since you're not a full-time employee, which are usually covered under the company's insurance policies, you're gonna to have to provide your own policies. Now, I don't mean medical insurance. What I mean are general liability and professional liability. General liability protects you in the event that you cause physical damage to company property, like dropping in the company's laptop. Professional liability protects you in the event that you produce bad work. For example, if you wrote a piece of code that had a security hole that resulted in a data breach, you would be liable for any monetary losses as a result. Now I have two policies and they cost me $1,500 a year. But if you think about the implications of this, it's possible for you to get sued. Now, what are you gonna do if you get sued? That's really an expensive process. Now to protect myself, I set up a limited liability company, which was about $300. But this increased my tax liability thanks to California's mandatory minimum business tax, which is $800 on top of my regular tax liability. Now, thankfully, nothing bad has happened as of yet, but I'm sure eventually I'll need a lawyer at some point, and that's going to cost money. Now, I haven't looked into it, but I'm sure it's going to be at least a few hundred dollars a month to keep a lawyer on retainer. But it would be a good idea so you have somebody to get advice from about complicated business matters. So then there's the tax man. Now, we already talked a little bit about some of the taxes that everybody has to deal with, whether you're successful or not. But what happens when you start becoming successful and start making a nice income for yourself? Now, that's when the tax man's gonna start calling. Actually, he's gonna send you letters. And what is it that he's gonna want? Well, money, of course, but we already knew that, right? But what you might not know is that he's gonna want you to pay him more than once a year. That's right. The tax man doesn't wanna wait until April 1st to get your tax payment. He's gonna tell you that you need to start paying on a quarterly basis. Now, the reasoning is that at the end of the year, you're going to have such a huge liability that he's concerned you might not be able to pay it and then you'll get into trouble. What a nice guy, right? Now, last year when I filed my taxes, they told me the same thing. I'm going to have to start paying on a quarterly basis. So now I have to pay taxes every three months and if I don't, I get into trouble. Now, one of the unfortunate negatives that a lot of contractors don't understand when they move into a contract is if you don't work, you don't eat. Now, salary employees, they get paid when they come in, they get paid when they stay home, they get paid when they're sick. Even hourly employees get sick time and vacation time. But contractors, we don't get any of that. If we're sick, oh well. If we want to go on vacation, too bad. You better save up. If we don't work, we don't get paid. Now, I usually look for contracts that offer remote work or telecommuting for many different reasons, but the biggest is it really helps me when I need to travel or when I'm not feeling well. Unfortunately, these are far and few between, so don't expect to find one. So now let's talk about getting paid. Now, this isn't the same as compensation. Just because you sign up for $100 an hour on a contract doesn't mean that you're going to automatically get paid like a regular full-time employee would. After doing your normal day of work, you then have to work even more or sometimes even fight to actually get paid. Now, first up are negotiating the terms. Now, what are terms? Terms in which time frame you'll get paid. Now, it's common for contracts to have a default net terms of 30 days, which means it'll take 30 days from the time your invoice was received, not sent, but received, until you receive payment for that invoice. Now, if you think about a salary employee, they usually only have to wait at most two weeks, depending on when they start in the pay period. 
I once had a company who had expectations of a 45 day terms. Now, if you consider the amount of time you have to work before you can first bill, which in this case was about two weeks, it puts it about 60 days before I was going to first receive a check. Now that really hurts if you don't already have a big bank account. Thankfully, you can negotiate terms. You don't have to accept the terms that they offer up front. And I usually demand a seven day term or I just walk away from the contract. Then you have to remember to invoice, then send the invoice, then make sure the invoice is received because emails get lost, letters get thrown away. And in my case, sometimes I just get so busy, I forget to flat out send the invoice. And then sometimes people just don't want to pay you at all. So at the end of the day, you still have to put in the extra work and sometimes fight to get paid. Now, once you get the check in the mail, yeah, that's right. Contractors usually don't get direct deposit. You have to make sure that the information on the check is correct. I once had an issue with a company who misspelled my company name. The bank didn't want to take the check because the information was wrong and the company didn't understand that the name on the check was incorrect. Now, even though the remittance information on my invoice was correct, somebody in accounting who was putting my information in their system made a mistake and that's all it took. It was a big hassle and a nightmare and it took a long time to get paid. Wait a minute, you didn't get your check? The client decided not to pay you? Yeah, that happens too. I once had to end a contract because it ran over the specified time frame because I had other obligations lined up. Now the client didn't like this and decided not to pay my final invoice. Now thankfully, with the well-worded email, I was able to resolve that situation, but I've talked to contractors who sometimes just never got paid at all. So if I can offer any words of advice in that area, it's to document everything. Your hours, your dates, your times, the projects you worked on, what you did, who you interacted with, everything. Because at some point, you're going to be questioned. And if you don't have the answers, you're not going to get paid. Now, this might not necessarily be a negative, but you always have to be looking for new work. As I mentioned, you can't expect a contract to be extended or to be offered a position as a full-time employee. So you have to look for work while you work and then still manage to negotiate a smooth transition. If you wait too long to look for work, there might be a time period where you don't have any work to bill for until you find your next gig. But if you start too early, you might miss out on a good opportunity because clients usually don't want to wait more than two weeks to start somebody. It's a balancing act and it takes a lot of time to build the skill necessary to maintain a steady stream of work. Now you can help manage some of this by increasing your hourly rate so that you have a little extra cushion in between gigs. Okay, so I've been referring to myself as a contractor, but really I'm a consultant. Now, I still do with contracts, I still do the same work, but there's some subtle differences. Contracts are generally brought in to perform a specific task, whether it's writing code to meet a specific use case, to help a team catch up, or to finish a project on time. Basically, contractors are support. Consultants, on the other hand, are brought in to give their opinion and advice, make tough decisions, and perform difficult tasks. Consultants have a specialized skill set that makes them desirable. Now, in terms of compensation, consultants get paid much better than regular contractors do, but that's because they have something more to offer than just their time. So I recommend, as you advance in your career, specialize in something that makes you desirable and valuable to clients. Now, the best advice that I can offer is to build a name for yourself. And you can do this by starting a blog, writing articles, creating videos, building content that's going to be useful to the consumers. And then promote your name and your content on places like LinkedIn, connect with local recruiters, and build yourself a network because you're going to need that network to advance your career. Now, the best way to do this is to specialize in something. Once you're known for specializing in something or have a specific skill set, the contracts will start coming in. In conclusion, I personally love being independent. I have anywhere from two to five contracts going at any one time so that I don't get bored. And when I decide to move on, I have something to keep me busy until I find that next adventure. But contracting isn't for everybody. It's very difficult to be a full-time developer, a full-time business manager, a salesman, and an agent because you really have to be all of those things. But for the ambitious few, it's a very rewarding career path that you can use to build the life that you desire. All right, that's it for this episode. 
be sure to subscribe to our channel and if you like this video go ahead and click that like button or leave a comment and let us know what you think thanks for watching